Welcome to Inc.'s The Founders Project with Alexa Von Tobel. I'm Alexa, the founder of LearnVest, author of New York Times bestselling book, Financially Fearless, and second book, Financially Forward. I'm also the founder and managing partner of Inspired Capital, a venture firm focused on the entrepreneurs of the future. Each week, we sit down with a top founder to share their story of guts, inspiration, and drive. Hi, everybody. I'm your host, Alex Montobel. And this week, I'm really excited for you to meet Tim Chen, co-founder and CEO of NerdWallet, the company helping consumers make all the right money moves. Tim founded the personal finance company in 2009 after working on Wall Street and realizing there wasn't much transparency when it comes to financial decisions. As CEO, Tim sets the strategic vision for NerdWallet and is determined to give consumers clarity around all of life's financial decisions. In 2021, Tim led NerdWallet through an IPO, and today, over 19 million users come to NerdWallet to explore banking, travel, and SMB products. Before NerdWallet, Tim was a hedge fund analyst at Perry Capital, investing in payment processing firms, credit card networks, and technology companies. He also worked as an equity analyst at Credit Suisse. He has been named one of Fast Company's most creative people in business and holds a bachelor's degree in economics from Stanford University. And with that, let's welcome Tim. Hi, Tim. Let's start with the basics. What's Nerd Wallet, in your own words, and take us back to the origin story of why you decided to build it. Nerd Wallet uh, really started off as a tool to help people shop for credit cards. And since then, we've grown into so much more. We expanded from just that credit card shopping experience into also helping you shop for just about any financial product you can imagine, from small business loans to savings accounts to Medicare plans, you name it. We've also built out content that answers just about any money question you might have, most recently expanding into the UK, Canada, and Australia. And then we also developed an app that helps you track and manage your money. If you have a nerd wallet account, we'll send you nudges when we see an opportunity for you to make a smart money move. And it's also important to talk about how we try to be different. I think what makes us really different from going to your bank or insurance company looking for financial products is that we compare across many financial institutions. Uh, So you're going to get a lot less of a biased viewpoint. And what makes us different from your friends and family uh, when you ask them for advice is that we've got a team of nerds dedicated to doing the research. Uh, So we really have put in the uh, elbow grease to do the homework. And uh, we've always focused on deserving your trust. Tim, I love the story back to those early days, the aha moment that really sparked you deciding to build it was you were trying to help your sister answer, answer a simple question. Tell us that story. Yeah, so um, that that moment uh, came in early 2009. It, it was a rough time. You know, I was working on Wall Street and got laid off during the financial crisis, and it was a huge hit. Obviously, in hindsight, it was a positive in that it opened me up to a whole different path. But, uh, you know, the idea of NerdWallet really stemmed from that time. I was having a conversation with my sister she came to me asking a question about finding a credit card. She was living abroad and wanted lower foreign transaction fees. And so I was kind of shocked that I couldn't find anything on Google that was really helpful. There's a lot of marketing stuff. There's a lot of spam. But yeah, it took me a a couple days of research. Um, I really started to get into it once I started looking at all the credit cards from all the major credit card issuers and putting together a spreadsheet. So I did the homework for her, right? Uh, It made me realize that there's a pretty objectively right way to pick a credit card for her. And it ended up being a spreadsheet that got forwarded around to a lot of different people. And that's when I thought, hey, I think we're onto something. The insight there was if you're going to ask someone for help with a financial decision, uh, you first need to know that they've done the work. And then you also need to know that they have your best interests at heart. Tell us how the product evolved um, now over the last, let's call it just decade plus. Yeah. So, you know, in terms of product evolution, we we really started off as kind of like a kayak type tool for credit cards. Um, And the first thing we did after that was we started expanding into a lot of credit card content. Um, There are so many things that couldn't really be answered by a tool. So many questions, so many niches. And then we really focused on just that for like three years uh, before we eventually started branching out a little bit into things like savings accounts, brokerage accounts, and insurance. And then it was probably another three years of focus in that before we started going even broader in areas like mortgage and student loans and personal loans and auto loans, et cetera. Then we eventually launched an app, a logged in experience, and have recently really started focusing on things like nudging you uh, when 
we know something about you and you should do something to take action with your money, right? And so, you know, it's it's been a long journey along the way, but it's really been all about continuing to listen to customers and actually try to figure out what they're asking for. If someone um, were to go back to those early days, does this feel right? Like, are you like, yeah, of course, I would be building a publicly traded company from kind of thoughtful, slow, everyday good decision making. Is this exactly what you had in your head when you started the business? <laughs> no, not at all. Um, honestly, initially, I was just irritated that there wasn't a better answer on Google to my sister's question. You know, over time, it, it's been kind of like rock climbing in terms of what we thought was possible. The the more we gained people's trust and the more reach we got, the more a lot of things were like, well, hey, if we just you know added a few more people, we could probably do this thing as well. And then as we kept on working along, we realized that we were in kind of a unique position to do a lot of things. And I, I think it's just kind of slowly built from there. I think bigger picture, um, I always did think there was an opportunity to um, you know, take a lot of the intermediaries out of uh, financial services that weren't that helpful. Um, there were just kind of some inherent problems I saw in the industry. Um, like, you know, generally a lot of commission salespeople were driving the advice out there. There's something about the wallet where it's sort of slow and steady in terms of the way you develop your user base, et cetera. Tell us just more about what you learned about your go-to-market strategy. Yeah, I mean, go-to-market go is incredibly challenging in our space because, you know, you've got uh, financial institutions spending billions of dollars a year naming stadiums and things like that. And then you've got a lot of uh, entrenched behaviors talking to your friends and family for help or, you know, user research. We found a lot of people had, you know, that aunt who's an accountant that they go to for everything. Yeah, year one was really rough. Um, I, you know, I had no doubt that this spreadsheet was going to be really helpful for consumers uh, who didn't have all that time to do the research. However, it was unclear that we'd ever be able to convince anyone to come to the website. Um, couldn't afford to buy visitors because we'd be competing against some people who were, you know, very established in areas like paid marketing, and we didn't have the brand recognition to compensate for it. So we really just focused on building a great product, writing content that was really helpful, and then asking the media to write about it um, in year one. By year two, we had a a pretty small audience, um, but it was largely organic. We got this following. It was maybe thirty to 40,000 people per month visiting us. Uh, we weren't making much in terms of revenue, but uh, it gave us enough line of sight into how big this could be and how could this could ultimately work. And so it was enough to keep on investing. And, you know, every year since then, it's been kind of the same, um, just blocking and tackling, trying to do the basics right. I create better content and products and uh, tell people about it. So it's been a slow build from there. What are the gems that you feel like you learned over the last decade and how you think about our education system and financial literacy and how most people approach their wallet? And is there anything that like frustrates you? I, I say that because there's some things that definitely frustrate me, but I would just love to hear your kind of hard earned thoughts around financial literacy, the wallet in America. To put it simply, it's become really apparent over the years that uh, America has two halves. So half of people are barely getting by paycheck to paycheck, and the other half has a lot more cushion and security month to month. And what we see is that one distinction drives so much of how people behave and what they care about. I think what cuts across both halves, however, is that you want to make good decisions, um, but to the point of financial education... After all this time, I don't think people actually want to learn anything. I think that it's people want to make the right decisions. That's part of what we're really trying to make happen. And then we've been through an incredible amount of market turbulence in in our in the span of our very short careers, right? And so I think market turbulence creates a lot of extra work for people. Um, whether interest rates are going up or down, they have to figure out a whole new set of ways to navigate that they haven't encountered before. In their, in their financial lives. So a big part of our focus is also just and making that easy. So when things like that happen, we get hard at work creating new content and recommendations that are applicable to the current situation, whether it's about stimulus, a rising great environment, or anything else. So walk us through capital and nerd wallet in your trajectory. First of all, I don't think we would have gotten any venture funding in our early days if we had tried. 
Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, but yeah, that being said, it, it caused us to, um, yeah, behave in a certain way. We, we always waited until we had the revenue before making that next reinvestment into our business. And by year three or four, um, it was, it was a really quite a profitable business and we didn't re- need to raise money. What caused us to actually raise money in year six is kind of ridiculous to say out loud, but you know, we, we were having an incredibly time hiring MBAs or whatever, right? Like we'd say, Hey, look at our financial statements and the size of the market. Please come join our company. We were struggling to hire engineers because they would ask who invested in you and we say, hey, look at this financial statement. And they say, I have no idea what that means, right? You know, that's actually the primary reason we raised money. That being said, we've been bootstrapping for so long that it was really in our DNA to not spend money we weren't earning. And so most of that money just sat on our balance sheet for years. Um, but, you know, being able to hire that world-class talent, I think really changed our trajectory and um, helped us grow a ton. And yeah, going public, um, was really just another financing decision, um, one with a lot of pros and cons. Yeah, so it's it's opened up a, a bunch of different options now. You know, we can access the capital markets more quickly, um, and there's obviously a lot of costs and disclosures associated with that. So it's something that we considered a long time before you know deciding to do. Tell us a little bit about what you learned and how you think about hiring world class people. Pay it forward with your best tips. In many cases, we just got lucky. Uh, but I'd say like, yeah, along different parts of the journey, different things matter in hindsight, the most successful people were the ones that could look at ambiguous situations and break down the drivers that mattered and tackle them. And, you know, one thing that I used to say back then was I'd rather you work on the right problem at a three out of 10 efficiency than work on the wrong problem at a 10 out of 10 efficiency. And some people were just uniquely good at, at spotting that. I think as we were scaling up it became a different set of skills. I I don't know if you've ever done any home remodeling, but that's kind of one analogy I use. Um, You know, some people are really magazine award-winning architects who have a very specific type of skill in terms of remodeling a house. Some people are scrappy general contractors who can tell you all the trade-offs between doing it the expensive way and the cheap way and help you make good decisions, right? And then some people have never seen, um, you know, world-class construction. Um, and so it really helps to have someone in the middle who can flex up and down and explain all the trade-offs and help the team make great decisions, not just in engineering, but across all the disciplines. If you fast forward five to 10 years, what's probably very obvious to you about maybe some of the innovation coming to the wallet that maybe other people haven't thought about because they don't spend all their time thinking about it in the way that you do? So what are your, some, some of your predictions that are going to happen in the next five to 10 years? There's going to be a, just a ton of personalization. Um, and I think there's going to be a lot more of, you know, nerd wallet telling you what you should do right now based on what we know about you, rather than you having to go and ask us that question, right? And I think that's going to create a lot fewer forced, unforced errors in terms of people either not knowing things or missing things or not asking the right questions on what to do with their money. And so for us, operationally, we think about that as um, how can we help first say hello to people um, through things like our content or our brand marketing, um, get them engaged and get more first party data from them through actually helping them with personalized answers to their questions. And then to remember that data and then nudge them again um, in the future when there's genuinely helpful things that they should be doing with their money. I think AI might actually make it possible for one human to help a lot more people uh, simultaneously and efficiently, right? Which can really lower costs and democratize um, access to that great personalized white glove service. Um, I think AI is quite good at synthesizing an existing knowledge base and training off of it. However, things change very quickly. So let's say the tax law changes around student loan repayment. Well, you still need a human to help train the AI on what to make of that. Oftentimes, simple heuristics become obvious from the tax law, and that's like the first thing that happens. There's a lot of connections that might possibly be made between, say, the tax law and financial products that are out there that require data sets that AI can't access. So, for example, 
well, a person qualify for this particular new product? Is the interest rates change? How does that affect the price of this student loan? And all sorts of other factors like that. So I think that's where, at least for now, I, I, I don't see a world in which humans aren't driving the training of AI and those productivity tools. I'd also guess that a big part of personal finance is really the psychological part of it. You know, staying calm when markets are turbulent, making the right decisions for the long term. Um, and so I, I imagine there's always a, a part of that that's better served by humans as well. Tell me what you think is possible with self-driving wallets. What I mean by that is literally just algorithms being able to make all the decisions around your wallet such that a person doesn't have to interact. I love the way you described that. Um, I think the sky's the limit. Uh, I got I got to imagine at some point in the future, um, it really is Tuesday morning, this thing pops up. It's like, Alexa, I saw that this uh, tax law changed. We'd really recommend A or B. Here's some trade-offs. I think for you, A is a good choice, but please tell me what you want. And then you click A and then you're done, right? And on to the next. Um, so uh, hopefully that kind of self-driving wallet develops so much trust because it's you know so much better of a driver than uh, you could ever be or want to be. Uh, so then it just becomes a part of our lives that we lean on heavily. I think that whoever does this, and we're, we're certainly trying to do this, is going to be in a position of a lot of responsibility to not get things wrong. And we'll be right back after a message from our sponsors. Tim, I want to transition a little bit to you. One of the things that's just been so amazing is you were really scrappy. You used $800 of your money to cover initial costs and moved in with your girlfriend so that you could actually make this happen. Where does that scrappiness come from? Because some founders have it and some don't. Where do you attribute yours? I think it really comes from necessity. Also, seeing opportunity, right? Like seeing opportunity causes you to get excited and causes you to just get really creative around how you can get that thing that you want to do to happen, right? So, I mean, the necessity part of it um, during the financial crisis, didn't have that much money saved, lost my job, lost most of what I did have saved in the stock market. Um, So it was really just about trying to get to that next milestone. And so a lot of things were off the table. It honestly created a ton of great focus. I knew that we could never make performance marketing work the first five years, for example, right? And so taking that off the table just was really simplifying and clarifying. And then I think that the thing that really irritated me that just kept on driving me to keep going was like, hey, I think our product is better than what's out there why is it so hard to get in front of people, right? And so that sparked a lot of the creativity around different ways to reach people organically that took quite a long time to figure out. (laughs) All of our parents did these interesting things to us growing up that maybe left a real impression on you that you kind of used through the process. What's yours? I've always been entrepreneurial since I was a kid. I had a very um, loving and supporting family uh, for sure. But uh, my my parents are also really characters. Um, and I'm funny story. I, I started to see a lot more of that now that I have a one year old and a three year old and um, my parents are doing a lot of babysitting. Um, I get to see some things that make me really open my eyes and uh, take note. So I'd say, for example, my mom is kind of the opposite of an overly protective parent. Uh, she's all about letting the one year old get into precarious situations and fail and then demanding that they figure things out on their own. So he also comes home doing unexpected things like throwing his own diaper into the garbage pail (laughs) across the room. I don't know how they got him to do that. Um, But I think all of that kind of um, contributed to me not being afraid to try tackling most things on my own. You've said before that one of your superpowers is being emotionally calibrated. And I actually am picking up on that on this interview, which is you seem so even keel. How is that? Tell us more about that skill set and how that's helped you be a great founder. I think a lot of this actually comes from my prior career um, as an investor. It really helped create this constant awareness um, around yeah, the animal spirits of yourself and everyone around you, right? Like I said, we we in a very short careers have been through massive periods of um, growth and contraction in the broader economy. I I think what that translates to as a founder is we've also been through massive periods of growth and also headwinds. So when we're growing, I'm really not afraid to 
think long term and let our profitability skyrocket. Uh, I'm not going to invest every dollar just because we're um, having a banner year. And we've also faced setbacks in the years past where I've really focused on taking the time to diagnose things properly rather than just taking action because taking action feels good. Yeah, once you properly diagnose something, then you can be a lot more accurate in terms of trying to solve the, the root cause of the problem. Back to the investing part, I think we've, we've all got lizard brains. There's a lot of herd mentality that happens. Um, and, you know, if you follow people like Warren Buffett and read what they write, their entire investment style is about taking advantage of those dislocations caused by the broader market during times of euphoria or times of panic. Um, and so I, I think that's really important as well to think about day to day running a business. What motivates you? What keeps you going? I honestly feel like there's still so much to be done. I mean, the analogy for me is like you're driving down the highway. There's a couch in the middle of the highway. You feel like it's your job to stop the car and move the couch out of the way because who else is going to do it, right? So, I mean, you know, we talked about the possible future for finance, the point where consumers don't even have to think about what to do with their finances anymore. And where NerdWallet can be that trusted guide. Well, if, if we don't do it, I'm not sure anyone will. You know, we, we have such huge organic reach. We can get in front of people so easily across so many different topics. Um, our brand can go in so many directions. So I really just feel like it's important to do that. The shift from early stage founder to true CEO is just a challenging run, right? It's so different. Give us one thing that's helped you make that transition. I think the biggest thing for me was... Um, understanding how my job was changing along the way. It's, it sounds so simple, but first and foremost, just recognizing that causes you to rethink your job rubric every couple of years and try to think about like, if I were to write myself a performance review, uh, what would what would that look like? And so that's, that's one big thing. I mean, I, I think the second big thing, I've come to believe over time that things should be relatively easy. If things are really hard for a long period of time, there's probably some form of root cause diagnosis that you haven't figured out. And then I think our tendencies as gritty early, early stage founders is to just keep on banging our head against the wall, as opposed to sometimes just making radical changes and seeing if they make things better. So for example, um, I've got an amazing team now. It makes my life a heck of a lot easier. I think the key question was like, well, how could you make sure you pick the right team, put them in the right roles and uh, make sure they succeed together? And that's easier said than done. There's a huge learning curve that, you know, we, we've gotten wrong at times for extended periods of time. But um, yeah, once things are humming, things feel pretty easy. I'm going to ask you now, uh, Tim, quick fire round, just quick, quick questions. First thing that comes to your mind and we'll go from there. Um how do you stay sane? What's one habit that you have that keeps you balanced through all of the highs and lows of building a business? Yeah, I uh, I got to have a book or a hobby or something that's going on alongside NerdWallet to give me a chance to recenter and meditate. So recently I've been doing a lot more gardening as an example, but it changes over time. <laughs> I love that. Um, at some point I want to see your garden. Um, what's your favorite interview question that you like to ask people? I like to turn it around on people and say, if you were interviewing for this job position, how would you design the job rubric? And, you know, what kind of person would you hire? I feel like it's kind of like a three dimensional question. One is just, I often learn things about like how this specialist in this particular area would form their job rubric, right? Like, oh, these things, things matter. I, I'm either going to learn something from it or learn something about how you structure an unstructured question, which is also important. Um, and I also noticed that people really uh, feel comfortable talking about their own strengths when they say who they would hire in a particular role, which is telling um, in, you know, both in terms of their strengths and the complementary people they need around them. What's one quote that you love? Uh, it can be any quote, but like maybe a quote that's really some, maybe something that you live by. I don't know the exact quote, but the, what Jeff Bezos says is that basically very few decisions are irreversible. And if it's an irreversible decision, you're often better off just trying something and learning from that rather than sitting there analyzing the decision. Even a tattoo is reversible, right? So sometimes you just have to um, really push the limits on what you think is a reversible or non-reversible decision. 
Um, and if it doesn't work, the cost is usually pretty low. Biggest pinch me moment to date at NerdWallet. One pinch me moment that you said, wow, I can't believe we did that. This happens pretty often, but it's sometimes you make a hire and they join your team and you're like, this person works for me. What on earth is happening right now? And what did I do to deserve this, right? And I can finally stop thinking about this problem completely and focus on other things. And we're in such good hands. So that I, I love it when that happens. I love that. Last thing, a book that's really impacted your life, a book of any shape, it doesn't have to be a business book, just a book that you really swear by. And actually, maybe I'm going to add it in a finance book that you love. Okay. I read Made in America by Sam Walton. He's the Walmart founder. He, he's such a fascinating guy. Um, but so many parallels between... Um, his journey and mine. He's been in more Kmart's, despite being the Walmart founder, and in other stores than like anyone else on earth. Uh, Talking to people working there, obsessing over the shelf configurations, the pricing, the pricing strategy, what works, what sells, what doesn't work. He would like stop his family on vacation and pop into Kmart's to do competitive scouting (laughs) up until he was like just a a few years uh, into his, well into his twilight years. So um, I, I think that's so hilarious. And I I identify with that so much because it's like this obsession about making the product great. And a finance book, I don't know, there's so many great ones out there, but I've been going back lately and reading stuff Warren Buffett wrote in the late 70s and early 80s because um, it was a period of inflation. And there's one called, I think, Inflation and How It Swindles the Equity Investor. Just this short essay he wrote, it just illuminates his entire mental model for how he invests and how he thinks about inflation. So I think it's very relevant to our times. Last thing I would just say, as a founder, one thing you hold is sacred. What really got hammered into me as an investor was that there's no reason any company should make profits because competition competes away all profits. Yet there's exceptions all the time. And so for me, it's really trying to... The sacred thing is that there are things such as doing right by the consumer, um, having unimpeachable trust, and just focusing on your brand that are very hard to measure, but create so much long-term value. And I think that gets lost on a lot of people in a lot of industries. Tim, first of all, I'm just so grateful. I'm like beaming because um, we're finally getting to spend some time together and just I'm shocking. Uh, I just like you so much. Um, everybody out there, if you haven't already checked out Nerd Wallet, please check out nerdwallet.com. Um, and Tim, just thank you so much. We're all rooting for you. Thank you for joining. And everybody will be on next week with The Founders Project by Alex Bontobel. Thanks for having me.